on this kid's uh, marketing or a networking event, and like the whole idea of us kind of like coming together and communicating your stories is what's important. Um, so I know you know it took a little time, but that's that's kind of I think why we're here. And I'd say outside of me talking for a little while, like you guys can support each other. Um, and that's going to be one of the secret, you know, sauces to making this all work for everybody. Because you all are kind of helping grow the economy in the area. And when I say the area, I mean all of Western New York, for sure. Um, so let's jump right into a story. We're going to go back in time in a world when the entire landmass of, of the country, of, I know, the country, world was one Pangea. Um, we're in, a, we're in a space where you can literally uh, smell the heat and the brimstone, it's so hot. And you can uh, taste the salt in the air from the shallow seas. Maybe even in the distance you hear a dinosaur crunching on some of its lunch from the upper crust. And that's where we meet our character. This is Frederick, and he lives in an ancient world called Fredonia. <laughs> So, who is Frederick? Frederick is just a guy like us. He likes to hunt, he likes to fish. Um, he's got a family of 15, like most of us. Um, and he decided, you know, when he was about 27, that he was gonna move away from his mom's business and finally set out and do his own thing. Um, he came to enough chamber of commerce workshops, and he's like, I'm gonna go for it. Um, so, he wants to be a plumber, and uh, you know, Guys, you know, COVID was tough on all of us, but this guy didn't even have Netflix or toilet paper to get through it. Um, and he faced just basically trial after trial. I mean, it was the hardest, hardest place to really start his plumbing business. Um, he was before his time, which, you know, we all go to market too soon sometimes and nobody had toilets. So the big problem was that uh, there was really not enough work. And uh, he was going to hold out for a while, but he faced problem after problem. Dinosaurs ate his tools. Um, he didn't have uh, enough of his money diversified. He put all of his investments in the wheel, but that wasn't coming for a while. <laughs> so once the Ice Age hit, things got really, really dark for him. Um, he was starting to get really desperate, and um, he had no really hit rock bottom and all his savings were gone. So he started to wander around what we know now we call the Western New York Wine Trail. <laughs> <laughs> and he found, basically he had to eat everything. He's, he's one of the first men to ever exist. So he didn't know what was good, what was bad. Uh, so he's eating branches, he's eating feces, he's eating all kinds of stuff. Some are making him sick. But somewhere inside of him he realizes that this purple, gooey, fruity thing him and helping sustain his family and helping sustain his tribe. And so he survives that ice age and his family survives and they pass down the most important trait that we all have as humans, which is pattern recognition. He has in his blood for the first time the ability to look at his environment and see consistency, see color, see shape, and he can predict what has value to him. Um, and that is a trait that 300,000 years later, we still have, <laughs> we still use, and that's really what the core of storytelling and marketing really, really is, is just talking to that little caveman inside of us, who is still in all of us, um, who is essentially looking for some very, very basic questions. Who can I trust, and where are resources? So I think a lot of us come to this question of storytelling and marketing with so many details of the end game. We're like, okay, is it reels or is it stories? Is it on Instagram? Is it YouTube? Is it, you know, you know, what are my life hacks? What are the 15 things I need to do to like skyrocket? Forget all of that. All you're trying to do is every single time you talk to a customer, you want to have an interaction or mark a story that helps them realize that they can trust you and where they can find the resources that they want. Um, and 
this, I think, will universally apply uh, to all of us. And let's remember this handsome caveman that's inside all of our genetics. Um, he is in all of our heads right now, asking those basic questions. And as you walk away from this, you might find yourself, if you really analyze your behavior, if you're, if you're really always just evaluating what you see for those two questions. Um, and so, can you trust me? That's the first thing you guys are asking right now. Um, Dan gave a little bit of an intro, but I'm Travis, and I started filmmaking back when I was 14, and I don't know if that guy on the left, left, left looks familiar. That is none other than Mr. Heisen Rader. Um, so we made our first movie together when we were in high school, and we filmed it in Gary. Um, about 20 years later, I did another feature film that we also shot in Gary, um, which went on to win some, some awards. So we did, did some feature films, so storytelling has been in my bones for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. Created Pan American Film Division. Um, we've made over 20 short films. Some of them have gone to the Cannes Film Festival and uh, screenings there. And we've done, a, this is four, but we've done about six feature documentaries. We've worked with major brands from the region and around uh, the country. And then recently I wrote a 200 page book about the Bills. And the Sabres hired me after they saw that to do their own version. And then I just did a kid's book uh, following up on that. So stories are like all I do every day. I'm almost too much. I have a workaholic problem. I'm doing it too much. But that's beside the point. So we'll share some of those insights. Um, this is a little reel of the work that we've done. I'll let, it, let you judge it yourselves.
pretty much every business that we go in that is open, we can trust. And there are resources everywhere. They're all over our internet. They're all over the landscape around us. So <coughs> I'm like when Frederick was alive. Um, yeah, we have an abundance of these things. So as businesses now, you're, you're in the very specific margins of, of competition, essentially. Um, and so the only thing that's going to convince the caveman to use you and not any of the other four places he can get a hamburger. Or how many places can you get a burger with cheese, you know, within 10 minutes of here? So, but like, when I think about it, if each of those places that come to mind have a different story, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, um, Sullivan's, uh, I don't know where else, but, <laughs> and actually that's something to think about. If I can't think of them, that's kind of strike one, right? <laughs> Why did I list McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King in that order? I don't know. Just probably because of the impression they've made through their story. Um, and we'll get into all of that. But first, we're going to have a pop quiz. So we need a brave volunteer. Who wants to go? Okay, you. What was your name again? Tanya. Tanya. Okay. So we're going to ask you, sort of like when you're at the eye doctor, they give you the option of what's better, one or two. So that's what we're going to do. You need to restock the work fridge. You go to a store and you see <coughs> this is what they have available. So do you want option one or option two? You gotta restock the fridge. Option one. You see me? Okay, so option one versus option two. And I'll tell you right now, these are cheaper. <laughs> you still want option one? Yeah. You do. And why is that?
insurance company that you use primarily on the board, you can put your hand up. Okay. And I'm going to take some away. Keep your hands up until your insurance company goes away. So if, you're, if it's still on the board, keep your hands up. Okay. So we lost three or four. How do we actually tell a story? And I did it really simply. So we're going to break it down into 
three simple steps, and it should be super easy to go from there. So how do you tell a story in three simple steps? You can't, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> the biggest thing about three simple steps would be don't use lists. <laughs> <laughs> lists are one of the least memorable things that you can do for your consumer to remember. And I'll give you guys a quiz right now. So we have six insurance companies on the board that NerdWallet rated the best. How many of you can name four of them? Let me see. None of you can name four. Well, I took a picture of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so your memory is stored, so that's yeah. fine. So that's interesting, and I guess we'll just say, uh, touche, point taken. I, it was the, the top six that was your opportunity to get the best insurance companies. They were in this form, didn't really make an impression. How many of you can tell me uh, the main character from State Farm commercials? What's his name? Jake, Jake, Jake from State Farm. Jake. How about the girl from Progressive? Flo. Flo, all right. Um, there's a duck that represents Aflac. Um, who else do you know? A guy with uh, band-aids on his face, and he's, yeah. he's mayhem? Okay. You know a company he works for? Allstate. Allstate? Okay. Point taken. We can remember Jake, we remember Flo, mayhem, Aflac. Liberty's got an emu, I mean.
didn't do a great job with my story at the beginning. Uh, it was rushed, I was looking at my notes, um, you know, I was feeling kind of lost in the story. But I bet you could tell me more about that story than you could the insurance companies we've talked about. But essentially it was a character that we liked because he's from Fredonia um, and trying to have some terrible nasty things happen to him uh, to, to create an impression. Um, any thoughts on that before we go to the next one? Kind of read the piece. Is, is the implication there though, I mean, let's say you had a story about an astronaut that just had a very successful mission. <laughs> right. It wouldn't be much of a story then. Right? It, yeah. You're implying that there should be some flaw of the mission right. to make it worthy of, of a good story. Uh, so, of all the Apollo missions, which one do we remember? Thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> yeah, because Houston, we have a problem. Is mm -hmm. that's great storytelling? Yeah. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. <laughs> I think it's more Tom Hanks. <laughs> Charles Dickens did this all the time of course in his did. novels. Yes. Greatest, probably the greatest storyteller. Yeah. You know, you, you'll find it everywhere. And we're, there's no reason your business can't have a memorable story. Houston, we have a problem. Um, you know, and hopefully the end of that story is how you overcame the situation you're in. Uh, we all went around the room and sort of introduced ourselves and told our story. And we, you know, hadn't had a seminar yet. We weren't sure what to say. But generally, we just kind of listed the boilerplate things about what our company does, the products that we offer. Um, I did it too. But None of us said, you know, I started this business because um, there's a huge crisis with trash in our environment. And after it took the life of my beloved pet, you know, I decided that's going to be my mission. And so from that day on, I clean up trash at the river. Um, to me, that's a more compelling story and something I'll take with me more than, you know, whatever. I'm Pan American Film Division, we make movies. Okay. Um, Another archetype of telling a story is what I would call the delicious model, which is that you ask a captivating question before you pay it off. So what would that be? Basically, any podcast you listen to tries to start this way, which is, you know, the most important thing my mother told me before she passed away that um, changed my life forever. And after a quick word from our sponsors, we'll get right into what you <laughs> all-time greatest Mark Scorsese movies. Um, and we're going to start from worst to best. <laughs> I mean, that is just the basic storytelling. You're going to stick around until you hear the, the payoff to that. Um, a lot of times people use lists as a way to motivate you in that, in that sense. And lists aren't bad, they're just not memorable. Try to put those in two categories. Um, there's nothing wrong with lists. You can organize your life with lists, and that's all good. But don't expect your consumer to feel motivated or memorable. Um, you know, I, I, like who, try to name the gold medalists from last year's uh, gymnastics, I mean, or last, last gymnastics. Probably none of us even know who won. But we probably, Biles? <laughs> no, no she, she dropped dead. Oh, that's you know, right. She, she which is the dramatic story <laughs> that most of us do remember is that she didn't complete um, I actually don't remember she, did, she might have been coming lower, but um, she did win gold medal. I think she did. Well, right. Of course, she's the best gymnast to have ever lived. We'll start with that. And then <laughs> she, uh, I think she did do well in one of the competitions. Yeah. And then obviously had the dramatic turn that. Um, and now, what a story that is! And the reason that a lot of us who like sports will be tuning into Simone Biles, you know, is she going to overcome? for this maybe last chance at, at giving glory again. Amazing storyline. Um, how many of you know the exact score of the Bills game when 13 seconds happened? Sure. No, but you remember 13 seconds? You remember it's the Bills against all odds? No, it was super high scoring game. Yeah. being in our head knows that it was painful and you also instead of just the caveman you know you also have some of the news score so it's <laughs> you are Bill's hat too so we'll give him credit for that. Um, 
So uh, ask a captivating question. And if you want to prolong your story, because it's longer form content, you want to pay off your questions before too long, but just have asked another interesting question before you've wrapped up. Once all the questions have been answered, the viewer is done, right? They want to move on to the next thing. Is that clear? Is that okay, last, last archetype I'll give you is authenticity. Good stories should hurt like hell and smell like shit. <laughs> okay? And I, I recognize that that dirty, dirty language is shocking. But I say it that way on purpose because it evokes a level of authenticity that you're going to tell a story that is actually true and actually close to life and isn't going to just lie to us. Like so much of our corporate business <coughs> talk is lies. So much of so much of the worst storytelling we see is just people needing to talk uh, that they're going to dance around the real drama in the room, and that is going to be forgetful. So. The other thing I like about this is that it's hinting at the fact that the visceral details are what we love about a story, right? If we can smell it, we can taste it. Remember this from English class. All of your senses, smell, taste, see, and visuals are what we're constantly, you know, that's our easy one. Um, what did it sound like to be in that environment? And I guess what did it feel like, you know? So, the best storytellers among us are taking time away from the main plot to let us know just how cold it was the day they were trying to get the oil rig fixed. And um, whatever, just how smelly it is, you know, to work as a sewer agent or something. And those things connect to that inner caveman in us. Um, so we're gonna take a look at a watch at a short story that many of you have seen. ourselves in him, maybe we like him. At the very, whether we judge him or not based on how he looks is one thing, although I think they get points for that. Second thing is, he has killed a lizard. <laughs> and then we find out it's not his lizard. It's, he's babysitting and he messed up. I mean, that is just such a right, raw story and I think something we can all really in, engage in and, and feel like, yeah, I've made major mistakes before, um, 
if I haven't done that, I'm super engaged because that is super dramatic. And they did this in five, 10 seconds at that point. Um, which is why, yeah, I guess so much of it is about like tech. It's not about time and energy and excitement and all the things we, we mistake, I think, especially like the YouTube trend or there's all these trends that develop and we mimic each other and we kind of get farther away from the core of what storytelling is. In my opinion, it's some of these basic things, which is, you know, in this case, a character we like, something bad happens, we're not afraid to go a little, a little real, um, you know, a little dramatic. spend too much time on this, but just to consider it. Notice how pretty much every brand has its own color. Yeah, Frosted Flakes are blue, Reese's are orange, and we know Reese's are orange from the other places we see Reese's. 
it's always orange. Um, chocolatey things like Cocoa Puffs are uh, brown, but even chocolate lucky charms are brown. Okay. Um, I don't think it's an accident that when a new brand came out, they tried to pick a color that wasn't the same. Um, and you're not selling cereal, but whatever your brand is, if you have control of it, you are in a, in a space when the customer needs it. Um, and the question is, do you want to look like the off-brand of Frosted Flakes? Do you want to set your own identity? Um, a decision should be made. You should take control. If you take anything away from the seminar, you should take control of your narrative. You should make a decision about what story you're telling to the consumer. And it goes beyond the Facebook post you're doing. That could be a part of it, but it's it's so much more than that. That's kind of the point I want to make. The other small detail I would make is notice how there's a character in almost all of these, and that a story is being told. Usually it's supported by commercials that we've seen, but it doesn't have to. If you only had the box of Fruit Loops, you see the cute character, and probably on the box itself, there is some sort of story being told with Toucan and Sam. You know, he's, he's got a puzzle he wants you to do, or she, I don't know, but, um, so. And hey, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but the adult brands don't have a cartoon character. I don't know. Uh, should they? I don't know, that's up for you to decide. You should sell cereal, but. Um, All you do here is put an X where you think you are on the spectrum of any of these things. You know, is your brand more of a natural brand or more of an urban brand? Yeah, okay, it's a little bit over here. Um, playful, serious, you believe in yourself, idealistic, realistic. Um, and I think this can really just help you to make those decisions yourself, right? To decide. You, you might not have answers to these yet, but it's good to think of that as you're on your journey to like what you're gonna end up telling. Um, and here's some deeper questions that are more like thought prompts. Um, I'll give you a time to take a photo if you'd like, or you can grab it later, or you've got it all memorized already, that's cool too. George Washington. George Washington. Who am I? Mm. From the same time period. Can anyone help him? Is it Krampus? Chris Kringle. Chris Kringle. Depends on the story you'd be telling in your household. <laughs> Here's a more modern picture. Santa Claus. <laughs>
really matter what his jacket was until Coca-Cola decided it should be red. Mm -hmm. And it has been red ever since. What was the time? Nast? What was that? Was it Nast, though, that did the, uh, the famous... The, the painting? Yeah. I think that... The famous Santa. Um, so... It might be a Coca-Cola ad, but it is very nice art. <laughs> it's beautiful art. Very, like, Norman Rockwell-esque. Um, yeah. So, Santa's going to illustrate a point here called the mere exposure effect. Coca-Cola didn't outlaw other versions of Santa Claus. They had no control over him. I mean, they just put a lot of that image and many other images of Santa wearing red out there into the world. And this psychological effect called the mere exposure effect took over, which is, to me, the biggest reason that branding and advertising works is the mere exposure effect. So let's explain what that is. The mere, merely being exposed to something makes you like it. You hear it a lot when they talk about Hitler telling lies. The more you tell a lie, the more some people will start to believe it. When something is out there, it is um, preferred, whether it's good or bad. And the reason that is, is still our caveman inside of us, because it's easier to process something that we have already understood. It's, um, I think for me, my personal life, the easy thing is when you go to a menu and like three of the items you've never heard of, you don't know how to pronounce, you kind of quickly are like, oh, let me just you know, go back to the things I know, you know, spaghetti meatballs. Uh, it's going to be a risk to try to pronounce this. I don't know what it's going to taste like. That should be signals to your brand. Is your brand something that people don't already understand? It's not spaghetti and meatballs? Or is it easy for them? And they know how to say it. They know what they're going to get out of it. Um, you know, that, that could mean your logo. That could mean, um, when I say story, I, I'm always trying to broaden your scope from like, OK, it's your Instagram post. It's everything about your company. You know, and, um, I do, you know what are you communicating that's easy for people to digest? Um, and it also gives a lot of merit to, you know, unfortunately, just having your brand out there or having your ex your story out there, whatever that is, which is why um, the biggest companies we know of, the biggest companies we support are doing that all the time. Jake from State Farm and Geico have the highest ad budgets by far. Um, another fun fact, the reason mirrors are up there is humans always, uh, um, from studies, prefer the way they look in the mirror and the way they sound in their own head. And if you see a video of yourself and you hear yourself from a microphone, you won't prefer that. And some, some of you will actually be like, I don't like that. Um, it's just because you're more exposed to the way you sound from your own head and the way you look in the mirror because you see yourself that way all the time instead of the reverse of it. So These days again, it might be more like, uh, you want to be fat and happy, consume a lot of sugar. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I don't think that would fly right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could you could ask uh, the. That's a val very valid question, like second level question of like, well, how are we going to portray Santa Claus and, and Coke? Do we want to align with, you know, jolly, overweight, friendly, or is it Coke Zero and it's all about you're <laughs> doing the Peloton while you're drinking <laughs> Coke? <laughs> um, so ads work. Here's the game. Um, I, I show these because you, for most small businesses, you, you will be the character of your brand. Um, you, you are the master of your own destiny. But some companies choose to represent themselves through like a surrogate, in this case. They, there's, we don't know who the CEO of Tyco is or State Farm or any of the decision makers, but we all know Jake. So they've, they've used their, uh, yeah, their marketing genius to create a character that's, that's outside of them. It, for you, a lot of companies, it's going to be you, though. And it can be you, and you should decide if it's going to be you or not. Um, but wait, there's more. And this is the thing I keep hinting on, right? Your story is so much more than the message that you officially put out on your website. You know, which painter do you, would you rather use? I mean, I'm sure you know the reason painters traditionally 
thing where right is to, and some bragging is to say, I can paint and not get myself dirty. Um, and if there's painters in the room, you know, ask yourself if that's true. <laughs> some of your professions, uh, probably a lot of professions, I would think that's true. The, the cleaner you look, the more I'm going to trust you. Um, but there might be situations where I want to hire a guy, right? I don't know. Maybe if it's like an art piece, I'm like, that guy looks more painted. I don't know. Um, so, like, here's theoretically the same person. I think it's literally Photoshop, the same guy. Wearing different outfits. And just ask yourself, which one of these guys do you want to pilot your airplane? <laughs> same guy, same skills, but there's one of them that you would probably prefer over the rest. And then, is that the same guy that you would want to uh, be the captain of your volleyball team? Industrial theater. <laughs> Industrial theater, yeah, exactly. stories we tell, in that case, going to City Hall, is, you know, we're secure, don't mess with us. Um, that's when we ride an airplane, for sure. Um, and when you get in an Uber, they tell you the opposite story. You don't even know this guy, just get in, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and, hey, look how easy that was. That's the story we want you to take away. Um, so what you're wearing to work is part of the story. Um, again, we're outside of the game. Okay, this is our last quiz. So I want two volunteers to go to the ATM. So you, and you in the back. Give me your names one more Justin. Justin. Stanley. Stanley, okay. We're gonna show you, same, same deal, high exam, one or two. So you're gonna pay $20,000 for a new roof. <laughs> we gotta decide which vehicle, that's all we're gonna get is the vehicles, and we gotta decide which one we prefer to use. So, um, one or two. <laughs> One. Okay. One. Okay. There's going to be more, so we'll go into detail later. But so far, we've picked one. And you were kind of on the fence. I, I was found that Uber works cruddy vehicles normally. They're really good workers that uh, get the job done very quickly. But I would say there is no wrong answer in this. I don't have the right answer. <laughs> I just want you guys to think critically yourselves and come up with your own ideas. How am I representing myself, and what message does that give to my consumers who are our test group? All right, so it's three or four. We've got two wrapped vehicles that say the name of the business. Probably three for me. Okay. Yeah, three. Three. So the truck was more important than the Prius. I feel like the truck's going to be able to bring the supplies easier, so less trips I have to pay them less. Sure. Personally, I've never met a roofing company that had a Prius. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's something. You're thinking yeah. competition. You're thinking, what is everyone else doing? Okay. In this case, you don't want them to be edgy. You don't want them to be the, the lone wolf that's like, yeah, well, we're going to be a great roofing company in Priuses. Or we're more con uh, cost conscious or something. It's uh, okay. So that matters in that case. So now we've got decals. Uh, we've got big rig. And we've got, you know, more, less big rig, but they still have some details. So one or two. Can I choose neither? Neither. <laughs> Yikes. i go with one, probably. Just two seems like it's the like, same thing with like the first example. It was like the first truck was like a little over the top. But like, am I, am I paying to get a new roof or am I buying paying, this guy? Paying you a new roof. Paying you a new car. Yeah. <laughs> There is a sweet spot, right? You know, between you know, the beater and the the car that's maybe attainable or yeah. I was turned off by a paving company. I wasn't even in the market for it, but the guy you could just tell, yeah, just didn't give me the right vibe. And he was as clean cut as it could be. He smelled like a 
Andre store, and I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. Um, and then last options, three? <laughs> Absolutely. Or four? Four. <laughs> Everyone? Yes, we'll go with our focus groups. What do you think? And there's no wrong answer. So I do see, so like I follow a lot of guys that are in our industry. Those cyber trucks have been getting a lot of attention, but I don't think it's been a lot of positive attention for the most part. Yeah. Yep. Like, I've basically heard exclusively negative things about those. Right, so we can talk about that too, but that's yes. important to think about is the story that's being told about your vehicle, right? Um, what did you think, Sheila, for it? I said uh, four. That's just like a yeah, regular four. utility vehicle. Yeah, even though it's unmarked. You guys are still like, yeah, I'd rather have a, like a more blends in with the environment, yeah. unmarked. Of course, I have a Dodge Ram too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All these things are, are actually good though. Like you, you're saying, is my customer like me? I drive a Dodge Ram. Cool. Um, I've never met someone who drives a Cybertruck. Okay, that's, you know, do I want to be that guy or that girl? Um, but hey, okay, so that type of exercise is something that you should be doing all the time with your brand and your story. And just thinking about, you know, when you are at a job site or when you are going to pick up a client, you know, what message are you telling beyond that? Um, because we all have this handsome William Defoe caveman in our head who's <laughs> just trying to ask that question of who they can trust. And trust is built on essentially positive interactions with is such a character and he did so much to generate uh, news and stories that that was sort of their that was their way that they could circumvent advertising budgets um, and so if you have that that's great and you might have a story where you earn media I mean that's what that's called earned media you 
you've created an event so cool, so interesting or unique, and such value to the consumers of the Wall Street Journal or USA Today that they want to cover you to get it out there. Um, that's hard to do, but it can be done. It's, if you're ambitious, if you're bold, if you're going to be a clown, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do that. It's shocking. Um, you can give headlines, and that can work. That, that's a strategy. Other people will just pay for that exposure. Um, yeah, and Elon put himself out there and told that story a lot, and a lot of YouTubers and whoever else you know, came to help support that story. Um, bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth noting. Um, so you are where your customers are. If your customers are on TV, watching TV a lot, you know, they're watching, even streaming, then sure, go spend your ad dollars there. If there are more people who are going to pass through and see the road sign, sign um, your billboards are what's important. Um, well, the other thing I would say about social media, um, you need to know that social media is kind of scammy in the sense that it gives you this perception that if you feed it, it's going to deliver the goods. Like, we think of it almost like a one-to-one. -one. I'm going to make a post. My followers who I've earned are going to see that post and hear my message. It is not one-to-one. -one. Facebook is closer to 20%. So you make your post. You made your beautiful video. You put it out there. About 20% of your followers who said, I want to get posts from the Chamber of Commerce, only about 20% are going to get it. And they're going to be your fanboys who like it anyway. So you can be a little mis misconstrued or, um, you know, they want you to feed the machine and they want to decide who they're, who they're, they're going to show it to. Um, you can break through that and get the positive return if you created something viral, uh, super catchy, it's very hard to do. And I don't know if that always converts. Uh, you can make your own decisions. Sometimes maybe it does, but um, it, it's really, I think something you should just ask in your heart of hearts, how many viral videos you've watched and then felt like, oh, that mere exposure effect makes me more likely to buy this thing. You know, Did we buy the shake weight just because we saw it a lot? Maybe. I mean, we know the name. Um, so something to think about. If you want a one-to-one -one communication with your customer, it's always email. Um, you should always be trying to get the email, the old-fashioned email. It has survived since 1970, till today. And it's still a thing that everyone will check every day, multiple times a day. Everyone on the planet, basically, will check their email. Even compared to Facebook or Instagram, you gotta try to catch them in the heat of the moment. You know, when they happen to be scrolling, you happen to catch them. If you didn't catch them, you know, they didn't happen to be on their phone, you've lost them, and that post that message is gone. So your newsletter list, your email list, is your most important place. And if you're going to do effort, you're going to spend money, you really want to try to get that email uh, if you can. Like, that should be the goal of your exercises. Uh, so um, that being said, with the Mafia book that we did, um, we decided to advertise well, we, we tried a lot of the traditional stuff first, right? We, we made a video that we thought was gonna be super cool and viral, which Heather was a part of. Um, it did okay, like 10,000 viewers, um, it's fine. I don't think it converted a ton. And, uh, and then we did some other content that we just posted and we got maybe like seven to 20 sales of the book. Um, then we started spending ads on Facebook, which is their goal. Right? They want to get you to the place where you're like, buy ads. Um, and once we started selling ads, it just went through the roof. Um, so what does that tell me? Advertising works, a good story works, a good product works, and your people who want it have to know that it exists. Um, so we can go more into the details on that if you want. I know we're running long right now, so uh, hold that for the after break session. This is a commercial that did really well. Should we play it? Sure. The West of New Fort York had changed forever. We thought we knew our enemies, our world. We were wrong. A 
17-year drought crippled the Niagara frontier. But when the Brigadier General arrived, he found something he did not expect. Life remained. Strong-hearted people had survived the mafia home, including a young farm boy with two first names. Josh of Allentown joined the ragtag team of specialists who made up the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show. The protectors of Allentown and the way of the mafia. Because the Buffalo Nation became the target of the Lasser Martyrs. Week after week, the fabric of time broke down and bridged faraway worlds and unknown cultures of every age imaginable. It was up to the gunsmith and the cyborgs, spies, and mounted men of Buffalo to meet the legends of old. They face the impossible, survive 13 seconds, Viking miracles, and two historic blizzards that drove us from our homes. Trust the process and embark on the most ambitious adventure to ever come out of a sports season. Journey through the wastes of New Fort York, where the banded flowers grow and the Zubans roam free where anything can happen, even the unbearable. Once in a lifetime, gift is an essential collectible to smash onto your heart table. And buckle is ours. Yours. Shipping now. is to kind of do the presentation, take a quick break, come back for Q&A, but we do try to stick to our scheduled time, and we are ran a little long on our intros. We started a little late and stuff, so kind of leave it up to everybody. We can do some formal Q&A quick if you would like, or if you'd rather just have some conversations, we're happy to break. I mean, we can hang out later than 3 o'clock, too, but uh, like I said, I know folks might have built other stuff in the schedule. Yeah, I'll suggest we do formal Q and A. Yeah, then yeah, and absolutely. Chat. And also, do, if anybody does need to go, mm -hmm. please don't feel, uh, you know, rude or anything. Restrooms are around the corner. We do have some snacks and things. Uh, yep. And everything. So yeah, I'll let you just kind of. Alright, have any thoughts or questions? Yeah. I just have a question about Facebook or social media ads. How much should people be spending? I mean, how do they, is it smart to spend the $25 and go right drop right down into your region, or are people, I mean, I assume people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook, but for like the small business in Chautauqua County, what should they be doing and how much should they be spending on social media? It's a super great question. Um, so what I found personally, and this is just sort of like, I'm just kind of mad, but the way they have set up Facebook is they they need you to spend a decent amount of money first, and they're going to learn your audience. And I think that's all just sort of a, a run around a little bit. Um, so what I would say is I've done ads in the past where I've done ten dollars a day and didn't have very good results. Um, and but I was not comfortable going up higher. And part of that was because my product at the time, which was a movie. didn't have a high profit margin. I mean, we were selling it digitally to market. It's a whole other story, but people don't pay for movies on digital movies. It's very low. Um, so for us to make money back, we would have had to get like extremely high conversion, which 
we were not getting anywhere close to. So I just decided this is foolish, save the money. Um, you might be in that situation too. Like I would think with yeah. the mafia book, if you put that on social media and spent $30, <coughs> it would go far because there's so many Bill's mafia and it's a cute story and you want to share it with your cousin and your neighbor. And sure. I, so I would think you wouldn't have to spend as much on that in, in this area and because the Bill's has such a huge following. Yeah, I mean, so let's use that as a case study. Um, we started pretty small with that, like, because we were already burned by Facebook. So we started with like $10, $15 a day. Um, and we saw enough of a bump to keep going and believing. And then basically what we got to, remember the book is different. The book is a $50 purchase. So the profit margin for us at the end of the day was close to like $10. So we could say, if we spend $5 on every ad, we still profit $5. So um, you might have a product that has that, mar that margin businesses, or it's somebody else's money and it's worth spending to get the word out there. That happens too. Um, not to name names, but there are clients who are just like, yeah, we're willing to lose $100,000 because we need to capture this market in female. Um, if you understand why those things work, it might make sense. But directly with that product, so we found that we had a virtuous cycle. We were spending enough and getting profit, so we're just like, let's keep adding. Uh, and we just kept doubling the budget every week or two weeks. And we were in the season and hype was going up and we were getting closer to Christmas. So it felt like this is the time to load. So we got to a point where we spent um, $100 a day on three videos. So we were spending $300 a day and we were getting over $1,000 in sales every day on those books. So it was worth it. Um, and so we just continued, and that's why Dan sees it eight times on his Facebook page, <laughs> because some people are getting super targeted. And, um, uh, so, and that that level of growth sustained itself. You know, we, we kept it, that budget till February, and we started to see the numbers were falling. The season had been over for a month for the bills at that point, so we still had good sales. So we just watched it. Um, and then, so same book, now it's the off season. We did two, two ad buys um, in the off season just to see what the market was up to. By the way, when we weren't spending ads, we sell zero books, mm -hmm. zero. It's not like there's a trickle. <laughs> it's just, I was telling Dan, it's a light switch. It's either on or it's off. And, uh, and then, so in the off season, we turned it on again uh, when Diggs was traded. And then again, uh, when we thought there was some hype uh, before the draft. And both of those times we didn't, we weren't profitable. We lost, at the end of the day, we lost either 30 bucks or 50 bucks. Uh, and that was fine. We spent 100, we made a bunch of sales, but it wasn't quite enough. So perfectly fine to be out there and test it. But so like I said, same market, same product, uh, different vibe, because it's the summer. We'll see again this. So that's a case study. I don't know if it gleans a lot, but if things are going, yeah, we spent money and got money back. Other questions? Any advice for like marketing something for your client for like exclusivity, like wealth management? Since we get 20 clients a year, that's a ton. <coughs> so you don't want to be out shouting about it. It's supposed yeah. to be like a club, right. but then you have to say something about no one knows you're there. So like, yeah, um, that's a great question. Yeah. Like movies, like.
potentially you could try to do speaking engagements uh, to teach people something adjacent to that. And oh, by the way, I, I'm, I didn't do this for this reason, but it's what I'm doing today. If you kind of know that I've made movies and that I have a book about the Bills, so if you ever need that, you're like, that guy seems to know what's happening. That's me to video me. You will start to think of me more than you think of someone who wasn't here. Uh, I know that happens on YouTube a lot. Like, X person is going to teach me how to do this about my truck or this, you know, these parts for your motorcycle. So I'm going to use Revzilla for my motorcycle now because they've given me very detailed analysis of like why this jacket is different than this jacket. Um, so I'm talking around it a bit, but I noticed that Rolex. You know, their branding on social media is just letting you know that they're at the Grand Prix, they're at the Kentucky Derby, they're, you know, um, just being worn by, like, Bezos and, you know, the top people who already represent luxury. And that's so different than Oreo cookies, right? So I guess it would be doing some soul searching and Describing that approach, right, is that like the Rolex example, they're still telling a story and they're still paying for advertising. And in a way, I, I think based on your presentation, it's almost more trusting than like Oreo, right? Because the conclusion of the Oreo commercial is like, okay, go buy a pack of Oreos, whereas yeah. the conclusion of the Rolex commercial, I don't get those commercials. <laughs> so, right, I mean, but I assume the conclusion is sort of more like, hey, you know, you're interested in this type of lifestyle or these things, yeah. we're, we're, we are too, right? Yeah. They're not necessarily converting that sale right. immediately. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you, if it really is that select, it's about one-on-one -on -one building trust with individuals, you could almost headhunt and say, I need 20 people, okay? Where can I find the people with the most, the top 20 people with wealth who don't already have a manager? Um, and then you just say like, hey, I'll take you to dinner for free. <laughs> and then talk to them and make sure that they see you as great. And that still feels one step maybe too direct. But there's probably one more step in there where you're like, you know, we're gonna host this free event and give away a set of golf clubs. And I don't know, there's something there.
person that you're talking to, your potential client, is like, you know, they handled that with class, and they're doing what's best for me, and um, I respect that person for trying to do it that way. Um, I think, uh, what do you see with everything going towards AI and building that authenticity and trust? Like, it looked like your movie Mother's Day was very dark and gritty and real, and you know, it's, I've worked in photography since the late 80s in a color dark room and seen the whole progression from negatives to digital to retouching to catfish filters to AI. I mean, obviously, Josh Allen wasn't coming in and dressing up. And, you know, like, and even now, I see these AI photos in Facebook, and I'm, you're looking at them like, is that real or is that AI? Right. You know, you can't yeah. hardly tell anymore. Even in Photoshop, there's yep. you know, you generate different backgrounds. You have to make yeah. people look way better looking, or yeah. whatever, like a completely different world. Right. So, arcade man was AI today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, is the broad question just like where we are at with it, or? Yeah, and where it's going with like that trust and authenticity, yeah, right. like with seeing these images that you. Not sure. Sure. Yeah, so I think it's a question of like how you want to use it. Like, so I used AI today to, you know, caveman was AI. Now, you ask yourself, and I'm not going to tell you what to think, did that make you trust me less because there was AI in the presentation, or was that a tool that helped? I mean, um, you know. Well, I think what is very clearly AI, like the mouth, like the right. stuff, but sometimes. Yeah, like, I, so I think it comes back to just like the normal core of like what's, are you telling the truth or are you lying? So if you're trying to deceive someone with AI saying like, hey, I'm a, such a good photographer, I shot this caveman. Um, <laughs> you know, or if you try to say like, hey, you know, this is my authentic voice in this email, but it's ChatGPT, yeah. you're getting, that's just lying, you know? Don't lie to people. But unless you want to be perceived as a liar. Um, but, yeah, so I would say, like, you know, the AI revolution is coming, and it's an amazing tool, and it's, like, you know, I think of it a lot like a printer or a calculator, like, these things disrupted the entire universe, and there was a moment where everyone was like, that's cheating, like, you're not a real mathematician, you know, you didn't scribble it out, except once you get over that, and you use a calculator, you're like, I can think four steps faster because I don't need to think about carrying the eye every time. Um, the printer, same thing, like, I don't have to carbon copy at all. I can just get 400 copies. AI is doing the same thing. You can create images without needing to search for the image. You just type in caveman, you know, beautiful eyes or whatever, and there it is. If you're talking about AI art, um, yeah, so, Depends on the context in which you're using it, I would say. Um, there's going to be people using it for various purposes, and that shouldn't be you. But I would consider it a tool in the toolbox. Um, and it needs human oversight still, too. Um, you should probably always be you know, the, the adult in the room with AI. You know, <laughs> even if it's going to help create your essay or do research for you, you've got to be looking at all of it and making sure that it's what you want to say. Um, 